Hi, my name is Colin Moore, President and CEO of Westward Gold. We're an emerging gold exploration company based in Nevada. Over the last year, we've assembled a 40 square kilometer land package comprised of three fully contiguous projects, our most advanced of which is called Toyabi, um, a short distance away from some of Barrick and Newmont's uh, most important mines in the region. And we just announced today that we're kicking off our 4,000 meter inaugural drill campaign. Really excited to tell you about it and uh, let's get into it. Colin, good to have you on board. Um, th thanks for joining us. Uh, a small but perfectly formed story. Um, there's a few people on your board that I already know and, and recognize. I'm, expe I'm expecting great things, Colin, not to put any pressure <laughs> on you. Um, and introduce this story to um, our, our audience and, and myself, quite frankly, because we, we've, we've not um, spoken about this one. So um, why don't we kick off with you? H who are you? What, what have you done? Sure. So I've worked in mining my entire professional career. I started out working in an underground salt mine when I was 18 years old. Um, so I was a mining engineer originally, uh, worked in ops for a couple of years before uh, very quickly transitioning to the capital markets side, went back to school, did my MBA. Um, and then I started working at Bank of Montreal in Toronto as an investment banker on their metals and mining team. Uh, when the market fell off in 2013, 2014, I transitioned to private equity I worked for a firm called Waterton. They were cashed up uh, with $2 billion in the bank in a bear market, which uh, has proven to be incredibly lucrative for them over the, over the last few years. Um, and then in 2017, I got recruited by another private equity company uh, called Pacific Road Capital based out in Vancouver. Uh, so that's what brought me out to the West Coast. Um, they went through a, a partnership restructuring in 2019, and I ended up forming a private gold company with a few partners, uh, which was Momentum Minerals. And that was ultimately the, the very beginning of the journey that became Westward Gold. Um, we, we vended that into a public company uh, in July of 2021. Um, but we've been working on that, you know, for the last three years, developing um, what we think is a really exciting land package in Nevada. Right. Okay. And, and which we'll get onto in a second, right? So, but talk, talk to me about the rest of the team. The names I recognize: Mark Monahan um, from, from of old, uh, and also Dave yep. Kelly, uh, who people may recognize from Chicana. So, um, tell us about the team who are active, not not the nameplate guys. Active, yeah. So, active management. Uh, the guys on salary. There's only three of us. Uh, it's myself, CEO, president. I'm also on the board. Uh, our CFO, Andrew Nelson, has an accounting and investment banking background. He's uh, born and raised in Vancouver. Um, our uh, VPX is Dave Browning, also you know a fairly young guy, but very uh, um, has spent his his entire career in Nevada. He's our man on the ground. He's based in Reno. Um, so he was with Miranda Gold uh, previously, um, and most recently, he spent a long time at Terracor. Uh, so what they do is hyperspectral imaging, um, and we might talk about that a little bit later, but essentially that, that technology has been one that we've, we've relied on heavily, and he's consulted to all the big boys in Nevada. He's extremely familiar with all the geology of Nevada and, and globally, so... Um, hey, well, so let's talk about hyperspectral now. I mean, yeah. it's not something that people uh, hear about every day. It's something that not, hasn't entered any conversations I've had. So what, what is it? What's it doing for you? Yeah, so it, it's essentially um, a fairly new technology. And it's not, I wouldn't say it's, it's rare, but it's rare for a company of our size to have the in-house expertise to be able to, to use it. Um, so what it is, is, is every mineral is uh, reflected um, reflects energy in a unique way. So the old school method of logging core um, is essentially with the naked eye and you give a core box to five different geologists, they might come up with five different interpretations. The, uh, the hyperspectral analysis gives you data points um, on, on every meter. Uh, so we're, we're measuring alteration patterns. Uh, we compare that to grade uh, on the assays and essentially you build this model of of how the alteration relates to the grade you're seeing. And that allows us to go back and not only enhance our 3D model, um, but also reverse engineer targets. So if you know that certain alteration types are generally associated with grade, then you know that in the field, if you see this, these types of alteration, that that's probably a good um, target for you to, to explore further. Right. Okay. And you, you've got access, you've got someone who understands it. Are you, 
I mean, are you using it right now? I mean, wh- why are we talking yeah, about so, uh, it? Yeah, so one of our big programs um, over kind of the the slower months, and we do have snow at our at our site. So so during the winter months, what we did was we have uh, 15,000, um, I believe it's 15,000 meters of, of old RC chips and old core that we have access to. Um, so what we did was we put that all through TerraCore's facility um, and analyzed all of it. And that really allowed us to build the model that eventually led to the drill targeting that we're going to be investigating um, in the coming days. Uh, I should also mention that Richard Bedell was a, the chairman of TerraCore, so he's also an expert in the field, and he's one of our technical advisors. Um, and we also, so you can do that for the core. Obviously, if you have access to core, you have access to RC chips, um, that's one element. But what happens for the area where you don't have any prior drilling? So what we did there was we flew an airborne hyperspectral survey, very high resolution. Obviously, it's it could never be as thorough as seeing under the ground, but it does give you uh, alteration minerals at surface. And then you compare that to what you're seeing in core. Um, so that was another tool that we've used to map um, the surface alteration on areas of our uh, three projects uh, that have never been drilled. So as far as we know, there's been no drilling at both Turquoise Canyon and East Saddle, which are the two um, less advanced in our portfolio. Right. Okay. But you're, well, how much cash have you got today? Today we're at about 1.7. We've prepaid. Um, that's Canadian, by the way. Yeah. Uh, we've prepaid. We've prepaid for a, a portion of our drilling campaign, which was budgeted for 1.3 million Canadian. That includes earthwork and assays. Um, so we're we're expecting. We we've left ourselves uh, probably about a seven hundred thousand dollar buffer by the time the fall rolls around and we have asset results back. Right. So there's no secret. Um, we will need to finance. <laughs> We're going to be looking to finance in the fall, um, hopefully on the back of, of a, a successful 2022 field season. Yeah. Like I say, you know, at, at your level, you can't afford things to go too wrong, right? Mining stuff, things will go wrong, and that's how you deal with it. But with a $700,000 buffer, it's, it, you know, it, it gets a little bit tight. So t- tell me yeah. what you know about the project you are going to focus on, which is Todd Yabi, um project. It's got a small historic resource, okay, whatever yeah. that was, 170, 175,000 ounces, that sort of level, right, um, from memory. What... What what else did you inherit? What else do you know? What else gives you confidence that that is the project you should start on? Because again, what's happened? What, what we see in the past is companies start with a small project, they use it as a stepping stone to go and raise capital, and then segue off to another asset. What's so good about this one? Yeah, and and you know we we didn't really know what we had our hands on. So um, as 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 the private company, we um, or just I should say I and, and my partners, we had Turquoise Canyon first. Um, so that's even less developed than, than Toyabi. And we always had our eyes on Toyabi um, as really a gateway to, to, to have some confidence that there is mineralization there. The historic resource, as you mentioned, um, it's 173,000 ounces at, a, at an average grade of 1.2. So, you know, it, it's nothing to jump up and down about, but what it does is provide a, a sort of backstop to value that you know you're not on total moose pasture there, right? There is... There is gold. There's also a past producing mine a few hundred meters away from, from the boundary um, of our project, which is now controlled by Barrick. So we know that there's gold there. We know we're in a system of some kind. Um, so what we what we did, um, and this was you know part of our due diligence process, is um, accumulate all the different drill logs and, and past um, you know surveys from other operators. And this is kind of what allowed us to recruit some some pretty um, pretty great technical advisors um, is that, you know, we, we think there's, we think there's a lot that, that, that was missed. What they essentially did in that very small area where the historical resource footprint is, is they went Swiss cheese on shallow, on shallow drilling. There was no, there was no uh, nuance about the, the prior, um, the prior drilling campaigns. It was, it was a lot of vertical RC holes, very shallow. Essentially they were looking for a sister deposit to the three pits that were mined 200 meters away from our border, right? And that was that was a past producing uh, heap leach oxide operation in the early 90s. Um, I think it produced for about four years. You know, it wasn't wasn't anything crazy, but it was it was shut down in in the early 90s when the gold price collapsed. And 
really um, an unloved asset up until this point. Um, our entire kind of mantra for consolidating this was taking, taking assets that were shelved by companies who had other things going on. So we, we managed to, to grab this property, um, Toyabi, from StarCore. Um, this was non-core for them because they have a producing mine in Mexico. So that's where all their human um, and capital were going. And uh, I think the, the consolidation play makes it more interesting because we have 40 square kilometers now and there's no shortage of, of targets. But really giving this project the attention it deserves. Um, going a little bit deeper, we have some theories about um, how the mineralization at the past producing mine actually trends onto our property that is different from the cross-sectional interpretations that we've seen from prior operators. Um, and just tying that into all the new data we've accumulated, including IP, hyperspectral, some, some soil and rock samples. Um, so, so we think that they really just scratched the, the tip of the iceberg there. And we're, we're, we're hopeful that we can prove up with very like, cost-effective limited campaign. I mean, 4,000 meters is, is not a whole lot, but we are, we are stepping out, you know, about 500 meters to the West, a few hundred meters to the South, a few hundred meters to the East of that historical deposit, because um, that deposit is not really the prize for us, right? That, that could be an indication of a bigger system. And I think, um, anyone, you know, investor, corporate, otherwise, you're not looking for 500,000 ounces in Nevada. You're, you're looking for 2 million ounce, 5 million ounce potential. Yeah, but, but that's the interesting thing, though. When, when I'm always fascinated by the, the, the strategies that companies employ, especially when it's sort of tight down at this level, tight, tight financially and tight in the sense that no one's really looking at, 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 you know, at these sorts of levels, right, except retail. And retail have a habit of misreading what the company puts out. And that's your fault, not theirs, right? Um, mm. th companies like to bang out big, sexy headlines, and geologists like to do proper drilling. And somewhere in the middle, that those two things meet or need to meet. So you're saying that you, what you're trying to do, isn't necessarily trying to you know work out. Oh, have you got a kind of start starter pit, shallow starter pit it with you know low grade yeah. over here? It's how do we use that to kind of identify a much bigger anomaly somewhere else, which could be the real price here. So yeah, how, tell, talk to me about the drilling specifics of, of, of the drilling. You, you kind of give us some clues clues there, but 4,000 meters of, break that down for me. How does that 4,000 meters break down? Sure. So there's going to be 15 target areas or 15 holes across four main target areas. So the first one we're starting with is called the California zone. It's uh, to the west, about 500 meters to the west of the heart of the historical resource. And it's on trend um, with what we believe is a northwest trending mineralization from the northernmost pit um, of that past producing mine. So that's what you're, you've got to signal that to the market. That's the, that's the intent. That's what you're trying to do there. Exactly. Yeah. And right. We, and we put out a PR this morning to that effect. Um, we're, we're kind of going to be going in drips. We're not wasting all our bullets in one PR here. We'd like to give every target area the attention it deserves and, and why it was part of that plan. Um, so great soil anomalies there, mercury and arsenic, which are traditional pathfinders for Carlin type deposits. Past drilling, um, you know, was mostly from surface. The average, so we, we identified 16 holes in the kind of 500 by 500 meter block that we're planning on investigating. Um, and the average depth was, was 85 meters. So we're talking pretty shallow, but there was a couple, there were a couple of holes that went a little bit deeper and we're hitting this second zone of mineralization between, you know, call it 180, 250 meters. Um, and that's, you know, we're going deep enough and we can go deep enough with RC, um, keep our costs in line, but also test what we think is the contact zone between two favorable host rocks. So we're in the Wenban and we're in the Roberts Mountain Formation. Um, the hyperspectral surveys uh, confirmed that for us. And, and those are the favorable host rocks at most of the barrack mines in the region. So Cortez Hills, for example, also important um, for Wenban. Roberts Mountain Formation. So we're in the right rocks, we think. We're, we're fairly certain of it. Um, we want to test that uh, deformation zone between the two host rocks because um, 
there's, you know, in the, the old core that we analyzed, there's a lot of rubble. There's, there's a lot of oxidation. We could be talking about, you know, a big tab, wide tabular zone there that was never properly investigated in, in prior campaigns. Okay. So, so that's one. And like I say, in, in all of these, I, th I think you're right. It's the right strategy. It's like, we are going to signal what we're looking for, be really clear about what we're looking for. It's not con conventional headline grabbing, attention seeking stuff. It's it, this informs a, a program, which we believe mm. will last come up with a hypothesis, which allows us to raise some money in the fall. That, that's what you're aiming for. Right? Yeah. And essentially, I mean, I'll be completely honest with you. I think the geologist probably won out in the discussion of what the purpose of this drill campaign is, because we could go and we could twin some holes. Sure. Um, Easy that, win. That would, right? be, that would be incredibly sexy hits, but we're totally forgotten about because they're from the 80s. Yeah. And some of them we don't even have assay certificates for. Um, so, but that doesn't really improve our geological understanding of, of what's there. So um, the happy medium, I think, is probably a little bit tilted towards um, the, the long-term thinking of the geologists. And, um, and obviously that's a risk, right? That, that is a risk. We, we're, we're a small company with a small market cap. So financing is, is very important for us. But um, at the end of the day, I think advancing the project in a meaningful way is going to win out. Okay. Number two, what's the second target? So the second target is what we're calling uh, TS down dip and TS stands for Toyabi Saddle. Um, so that's the pit, um, as I mentioned, the, the past producing line that's now controlled by Barrick a little bit, 200 meters for, from the south of our, our boundary. There's very limited, limited drilling between that pit and um, our historical resource. And the thinking was, um, was that the, the dip was moving in a different direction. Um, so we now believe from our extensive review of, I think five different operators have been drilling this and we've had people walking it. Um, we think that the mineralization is actually dipping Northeast. So we think that Toyabi Saddle is a surface expression of the mineralization that dips actually below the historical resource to a region where they barely reached on a couple of holes, about 300 meters deep. So the purpose of drilling the TS down dip between those two is basically to figure out if it actually is dipping in that direction. If we hit that, you know, it's simple math, right? If, if you draw a line between, between the two and you figure out, oh, this is the angle of the dip. Um, and if that then lines up with what we're seeing to the west and to the east of it, then we could be in something really interesting, which is kind of a 40, 50 meter zone of oxidized disseminated gold, which is what, what we're hoping for. Um, and, and that's really similar to, to why we're, we're then going east. You know, we're, we're really modeling out that potential, potential tabular zone. Um, and I might as well just get, get to the, the next two targets, which are related to, um, a fault right to the east, right, really close to our, our boundary with Turquoise Canyon. So that fault was actually a totally new target. We didn't know about it until we had all of our technical advisors and some board members, including Dave Kelly, uh, down on site in the fall. And they noticed that there was Jasperoid and a fault line that had never been mapped and we didn't know about based on um, previous maps from, from other operators. So they got really excited about it. Um, we've since confirmed some of that with, with some IP that the fault is there. So what we're going to be doing is, is fencing that fault on either side um, with about, I think it's eight holes. So eight holes are going to be dedicated to both the northern portion of the fault and the southern portion of the fault. And this also will help us because the ultimate goal is to, to move eastwards um, to the west, we actually, you know, we run out of land and it, it dips down into a gravel pit and it's not super interesting. But to the east, we have, um, you know, four or five kilometers um, of, of potential strike length to, to move on to Turquoise Canyon. And that has never been drilled before. So that kind of boundary zone where that fault is, that's, I don't want to call it a pure Hail Mary, but it was, it was a target that has 
honestly really never been drilled. I think there's one hole we identified um, that TD'd at only 50 meters or so. Um, so that that is our some days I think it's the most exciting. Some some days I get really nervous about that target, but I, I think um, you know all the indications that are are there that it could be pretty exciting. Okay, and um, okay, so, so, so that's the game plan, four thousand meter plan, and, and it, it kind of makes sense to me. And I, I'm glad you, you know you said like you know there's a kind of honesty to what you're saying in, in the sense that we're here to try and do it right, that rather than just kind of you know bang out the the, the headlines which may kind of gain us some momentary win. Um, what, what about you guys? Because I'm noticing that the management team are kind of sitting on a on, on a bunch of stocks. So how invested are you? Yeah, so the management team and the directors and advisors are by far the largest um, holders at this point. I think we're at 22%. Um, I own about 1.6 million shares. Um, but yeah, we've been, we've been active participating in the financings, um, buy on market. Um, we don't have a big burn rate. As I mentioned, there's only three of us on salary. So most of our money, and, and honestly, most of our monthly salary, a lot of time goes back to buying shares. Um, we we're we're invested, we're aligned. Um, we will be participating in every round in the future. That's that's a, a given. Um, so so yeah, and and I don't manage any other public companies or private companies for that matter. This is my full time job. Right. Okay. And so, and I know you kind of vended this in, so you kind of picked up a lot of that as part of that vending, right? Um, to the public vehicle. Um, so just, just want to be clear, you're, you're putting in money. How, how much actual cash have you put in? Like, how, how serious is this for you? Um, yeah. So I probably, I don't want to misspeak, but so in the last financing, I, I bought 300,000 shares for 36 grand. Um, I'm probably into this for about 60. Right. Total. And uh, I know that probably that might not sound like a lot, but I, I also unfortunately just bought a house. So that, that was my head. I had a, a fairly large down payment I had to make. Right. Um, but we are reinvesting the cash uh, that Westward pays us into stock and, and we will continue to do so. Right. Okay, fine. Just, just, want, to, just want to be clear because sometimes it, it doesn't need to be a big amount. It just needs to be meaningful. Right. So I think that's yes, what, yeah. I, what I was getting at. Okay. Um, Okay, so what are we what are we looking forward to? So, so you're lots of little small stories like you. What are the things that make you guys different? You've explained the the process you're going to go through. We've met. We talked about some of some of the team here, and you've been clear about wh where the finances are today. What's going to give you more chance of success than the next guy? Yeah, and I and this is a question uh, that I, I knew would come up, and and everyone could talk about you know cheap valuation. Mind finders on the team, great location, great assets. I'm not going to pretend that we're the only company that has all those factors. One of the kind of factors that sets us apart a little bit is this use of technology, the hyperspectral that I mentioned. That is, that is, you know, an angle that we have that I think gives us a little bit of an edge up, um, not only in our targeting, but also when the big boys look at potentially making investments. Um, they are using this technology. So Barrick and Newmont, Anglo, they're using that technology. So a lot of the times it's about acquiring data, not just acquiring the project. Um, so I think that might give us a little bit of a leg up. Um, but but yeah, I, we, we have all the factors in play. Um, you know, Stephen Kaler is, is, on, is very active. He's doing all of our mapping. Um, this season on on the the areas that we don't know as well. Um, so he's so made eleven. Who's he? I don't know who he is. Yeah. So Stephen Kaler uh, on our technical advisory board. Um, he was on the discovery team at Cortez Hills. Um, he was also most recently with Gold Standard Ventures when they had that big run up. He's made a, eleven Carlin type discoveries in Nevada. Six of them are now producing mines. Um, we kind of pulled him out of retirement. He doesn't have to work a, a day in his life again if he chose not to. Um, and then Richard Bedell um, was with AUX Ventures when they discovered Long Canyon in Nevada. That was ultimately sold to Frontier. And then Newmont came around and bought Frontier for $2.3 billion. So some significant um, Carlin, Nevada discoveries, um, you know, know your neighborhood. And these guys have walked 
almost every inch of Nevada. So um, I think it's a testament to our company that we were able to recruit those guys because they don't necessarily need to have any business with, you know, a $5 million, what, what was at the time, a $5 million market cap company. Um, so they're getting back to their roots. They, they love kicking rocks. Uh, I'm going to be on site with them in two weeks going through the project. Um, and yeah, everyone's cautiously optimistic. <laughs>